the seven churches. A couple things I want to let you know, they're kind of available to you. One, we have put some pictures of a timeline that I made, which is actually right here is the big scroll that I made years ago for a class. And it actually timelines out from the church age to a new heaven and new earth, all written out right here. It's kind of hard to put that entire thing on one picture, so we broke it up. They should be on the app. So if you wanted to pull up the app, they should be in there. If you want to look at it, you can zoom it in. But if you want to just come and see it live in person, there it is. It's in the photos. Okay. Do you have the photo of tonight? Is it on the app too? Is it in photos? Okay. So there's one that we're going to get in tonight, and then you have a stack of papers. Uh, yeah. If I can have one of those. And then if you don't want to use the app to look this up and want just the piece of paper here, Tracy can bring you one. Or Chuck or Jeffrey or anyone who wants to volunteer to help out here. Y'all can jump up and... <laughs> All right. And hopefully by the time we're done... This will make sense tonight. All right, so if you remember the timeline that we talked about before, we start, and everything with Revelation, it's starting from the crucifixion, the first century church, on to the end of all things, and we have new heaven, new earth. We're going to look at chapter 2 and chapter 3 tonight. We'll see how far we get. These are the message to the seven churches. We're going to look at these seven churches these seven churches all represent the church age. So the time that we're going to be discussing tonight is from the cross to the rapture. It's the before us to the now where we are and right up to where the rapture, which could be any moment. It's not this moment because it didn't happen, but it could be any moment. We know it's coming. All right. Very good. Okay. If my um, drive is still logged in, it's in slides in there if you want to just slide it over into Media Shout that way. Okay. Y'all can do however. Y'all got the paper right here in front of you. Let's dig in. We're going to start in Revelation chapter 2. All right, chapter 2, starting in verse 1. The angel of the church in Ephesus write. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write. Let's remember when it's talking about the angels of the churches, these are the church leaders, the pastors. This is not a heavenly angel at the church of Ephesus. This is the church leader he's saying to write. You reference back to chapter 1 and you see that. The one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands says this. Who is this who holds the seven stars and walks among the seven churches? Jesus, okay? This is him. And he's saying, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men. And you put the test those who call themselves apostles and they are not and you found them to be false and you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not gone, uh, or grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent." Yet this, uh, yet this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. For he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Father, we first want to thank you for your word. Open our hearts, open our minds. Be with us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, tonight on our study, I'm actually going to be reading a few excerpts from M.R. DeHaan's study in Revelation. Great book. Really recommend this if you want to study Revelation. If you want to study the tabernacle, then get his book on the tabernacle. But if you want to study Revelation, this is a really good one, uh, along with uh, Wearsby's V. Victorious, Lehman Strauss. I've, I've got several if y'all really want to see them. But I wanted to read this to you. All right. All right, 
The seven churches are called the candlesticks in chapter 1, and Jesus Christ is seen at the beginning walking among them. Chapter 1 gives us the most complete picture of Christ and his glory of his coming again to be found anywhere in Scripture. Uh, read it carefully and behold the Holy Spirit's own portrait of the coming glorious king. We talked about a little bit that last week. You get towards the end of chapter 1 and you see Christ walking amongst the churches. And that's just really this beautiful moment, what he is doing today and what he's going to continue to do even into eternity and seeing the rapture of the church. There's going to be Christ in and amongst. It's this beautiful moment. Go look that up. Okay. Various views have been held by Bible students regarding the meaning of the seven churches in Revelation. First of all, we do believe they represent seven literal assemblies of churches. These are seven actual churches that existed at the time John wrote this, which would be during the first century church. These are literally seven churches in existence, cities, places. True, absolute. We're not taken from that. Secondly, these churches also present a picture of seven different kinds or types of assemblies of the entire world or the entire church age. Again, I agree with that. I believe these are seven churches that will show the characteristics of the church. You can fall in one of these seven categories. I believe that. I believe that is true. I believe in every church age to look at it or across the entire church age as we look at it, there is this application from each church that could apply. Now, some of these, you don't really want to fall into one of those categories. <laughs> you don't necessarily want to be identified as some of these churches, but there are churches that could represent in all of this. But I agree with the hunt on this. Uh, let's see, we know churches like Thyatira are full of ritualism and ceremonialism, different from paganism and Sardis, that they're still in form today and the applications can be made. Uh, but all these applications can be made to the seven churches, but we are reminded in chapter one that Revelation is a prophetic book. So we look for a prophetic meaning in the description of these seven assemblies. It's true. This book, the book of Revelation, the revealing of Jesus Christ, it is a prophetic book. So everything written has these meanings. And as we look at these churches, there is prophetic meaning. We have the advantage of history. We can look back through history and see all of the evidence of these church assemblies and their bodies through time. And that's kind of what I've given you here on this piece of paper, which we'll break into. First church is Ephesus. First church listed. We just read about Ephesus. It represents the first century church. This is the first church. This is Paul and John and Peter, James. This is the church that they've started and carried on out and gets in that whole first century, Okay. That's what Ephesus represents. You move on from Ephesus, you get to the church of Smyrna. Okay, it represents the second and third century church. Specifically, they got this one nailed down to 312 AD, and I'll cover that in a minute. It's very interesting because most of these have a, a vague time area. It's not like a specific moment, but there's this transition from Smyrna to Pergamos has a definite line of demarcation. This is when it changes, and we can look in history and see exactly that change, and it's really cool. And then after that, you got Pergamos. Thyatira, if you look, I continued the line, or had Tracy continue the line on over to the rapture, even though there are still three church ages after that. We did that intentionally, because when we read in here, you'll see that the remnant of this false church, I'll go ahead and tell you, remains until the great tribulation. Don't you see false churches around? Don't we hear false message around? That all rims and stems back from this church and what they were doing and what happened during this time frame. We'll try to cover that as best we can. This may take a couple weeks to get through all of it. And then you have Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Just so you know, do I believe we're in the Laodicean church age? Yes, I do. I fully believe that. Do I believe we're still living out some of the effects of the Philadelphia Revival Church age? Yes, I do. But personally, I feel we are in the Laodicean age, the apostate age. There are some who take in to believe that the apostate church actually comes into the effect after the rapture. I don't agree with that personally because the church is raptured away. So you won't have a church here on earth to have that apostate false church. Uh, that they're talking about. The church remnant here in Ephesus, there are, or not Ephesus, Laodicea, when we get there, you'll see they're doing a lot of bad stuff. They're lukewarm, but they're still brethren believing. So when the rapture comes, they're out. So I don't believe the Laodicean church age starts 
after the rapture. There's my two cents on that. You already get into this? All right, Ephesus, right here. A couple things we need to know. Look how Jesus identifies himself. He says, I am the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I am the one who has held you. I am the one who is holding you up and I am the one that walks amongst you. You better listen to what I'm about to tell you. That's what he's trying to tell them. Now, my Bible, I hope you guys have one of these. These are red letters. I like red letter Bibles. That means Jesus is saying this. So if you don't have a red letter Bible, get with me. We'll help you find one if you need one. It really helps with study. Not a requirement to have red letter Bibles. It's just really helpful to have a red letter Bible. So this is Jesus speaking here to Paul, Paul, to Paul, to John. I got Paul on the brain. Speaking here to John, John sending this message out. I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance that you cannot tolerate evil men. That's a plus. That's a plus of the first church. Hey, you've got this. You're working hard, you're toiling at it, and you're not tolerating evil men. Good. He also tells them down here, you're standing against the Nicolaitans. Okay, those were a group who were coming against trying to persecute and put down and push out the church. They're taking a standing as that they're not letting this happen. That's good. You have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. Positive. But I have this against you. You've left your first love. See, <laughs> we, 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 want, we want to get in and think that church is always all perfect and all good and we're getting there, but in every church age, even in doing good things, there's this one primary issue. You can do good things and be in sin because you're leaving your first love, and that's Jesus. You're turning from this. Like you're standing on righteousness for the sake of yourself, not standing on righteousness for the sake of Christ. And that's some things that kind of started happening as you look through the first century church. They really just started going through some stuff. But all in all, they get a pretty decent commendation. Now, if you guys are interested, I started tooling through some papers, and I've got stacks and stacks of notes here on the different churches that you can look at, breaking down names and different things. Now, this one, this is Ephesus. It is the backsliding church because they lost their first love. But they do have... Some, some commendations with them. Did they get some condemnation? Yeah, they lacked their devotion. They lost their first love. But let's, let's just keep reading. Let's just get there. Uh, Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deed you did at first or else I am coming and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Yet this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitan, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Even here in Ephesus, where they're starting to slide away, they ran, they started this out great. I mean, look at what Paul, what we've been going through in our journey in Acts. This church started with great momentum, a lot of good things happening. But 100 years in, century, I'm not talking decades, century, this is first century church, starting to lose a little of that fire, and they're starting to lose their first love, they're starting to lose that focus. And here's the message, hey, if you repent, if you repent, if you repent, if you'll turn from this, there's still hope for you. You repent. Let's even see. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the seven churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, if you really want to think tree of life, let's think all the way back. Where's the first time we see tree of life? Eden, right? It's taken, hidden back. We're going to find the same tree. If we'll repent and we'll return to our love in Jesus Christ. And as the church here, if they come to Christ, he's given them this promise, you're going to make it there. You're going to make it back, and you're going to be given the right to eat of that tree of life. And what he's saying is you're going to have that right to eternity with God the Father as you repent and return to Christ. That's the message to the first century church. Verse 8. And the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the first and the last who was dead and has come to life says this this is Jesus again this is how he's identifying himself I am the first I am the last I was died I had died I was in death but now I am alive I know your tribulation I know your poverty but you are rich and the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not but are the synagogue of Satan do not fear what you are about to suffer. That can't be comforting. 
if I'm receiving this letter and I'm getting this, don't fear what you're about to suffer. I think I'm getting ready to leave Smyrna. <laughs> I'm just, when Jesus himself is writing this, but this is again, prophetic book, prophetic moment. Did the church in Smyrna go through suffering? Yes. Were they in poverty? Yes. But what we're going to see in the second and third century with the church is some severe persecution. Let's keep reading. But do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for 10 days. That's a 10 days in a kind of divine calendar. It's not 10 actual days. This could be 10 years. This could be 10,000 years. This could be 10 actual days. There's no determined, like this is a time. He's giving you, there is a period of time. What he's trying to say in this 10 days, there's going to be a start to this. There's going to be an end to this. This will pass. This will end. But we have the time here of 10 days. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches who overcomes and will not be hurt by the second death. Notice how he says this. Overcome, press in, stay faithful until death. Until death. But he who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. He's telling them, there's going to be a lot of you. You're literally going to die. But you will not enter into an eternal death. You're going to enter into an eternal place with me. I'll give you a little history here. Don breaks this out really great. Smyrna was the persecuted church of the second and third century. Here we go. This is the persecuted church. The words are prominent in this passage are tribulation, poverty, suffer, prison, and again, tribulation. The last tone perfectly describes the church of the second and third centuries when the ancient Roman empire sought to, sought to eradicate the faith of Jesus from the earth. The Christians were burned, beaten, hanged, crucified, cast to the lions, and tortured to death. It seems that Christianity must cease to be. That was their push it must cease to be 10 years this is something that's interesting it said it's a period of 10 years well we can look back and see in this under 10 tyrants from Nero to Constantine the Great the church was persecuted unto death the history of those 200 years is the blackest in the history of the church Smyrna was chosen was the chosen symbol therefore of this church period um uh, the word Smyrna comes from the word myrrh. It's kind of interesting. Myrrh, that gift that was brought to Christ, is actually has to be crushed and pounded and beaten down to then let out its fragrance. You don't get that fragrance of myrrh till you take and get it and you crush it and you beat it. And then it releases the fragrance that it's known for. And that spice. All right. The second age in church history represented by Smyrna lasted for some 200 years. During the time, tens of thousands of Christians were put to death for their faith and sealed their testimony with their blood. So we can look at history and we can see, we get this big clue, we see the 10 years and then you look back at the Roman Empire, you see the 10 tyrants. So that could be an evidence there to the church there at the time is writing the 10 days. Um, I don't know specifically what that church went through in that time. There's not a lot of history to the direct of any of these seven churches. Ephesus, we have the most history, and we all know that Ephesus came to complete ruin. Its candlestick did go out. You can go and see the ruins of Ephesus today. Travel out there and look at it. It's gone. All right. When we're looking here at Smyrna, there's a transition from this persecuted church to Pergamum, which is almost like the blessed church. There's this great change and shift that happens. Okay, let's just read it first. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, the one who has the sharp two-edged sword says this, 
I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you because you have some who hold the teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit acts of immorality. So you also have come who in the same way hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Here they come again, trying to pervert and change and kind of wipe out the truth of the doctrine. Therefore, repent, or else I'm coming quickly to you. And I will make war against them with my sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to him who overcomes. To him I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. A couple things you can kind of look at. There is this push here because it's talking about he's going to come and wage the war with the sword of his mouth and they're saying that that is the direct application of when he's talking and he's coming back for the battle of Armageddon because that's exactly what's going to happen we can get to Revelation 19 we can see that but I don't believe in this that he's trying to say that this church will remain to that time what he's saying is he's going to come against those who are coming into the church, the falsehood, that at that point when these false teachers have come and risen up that keep trying to infiltrate the church, that's when I'm going to deal with them. That's when I'm waging war with them. He's not saying that this church is going to remain until then. That's Pastor Heath's view, okay? When I'm looking and studying the, the theory, the spirit of this church, if you want to say it that way, has a time in which it ends before the time of the message to Thyatira. Um, I do see that. I get it. It says that it's going to, against them, the war against them with the sword of his mouth. I know that is direct. What he's going to do in Revelation 19 will get there at some point. But in that moment, what he's doing, he's warring against those who are coming against the Jews specifically on earth, but who come against his message, who come against his word, who come against his people. That's when Christ is going to come and he's going to win that war. As all the armies of the world are going to come against Jerusalem. They're going to have this big uh, Valley of Megiddo is going in large, big battle. Jesus coming down on the white horse. We're riding down behind him. He's going to jump off, set two feet on the Mount of Olives, and by the word of his mouth, millions will die. Right here. Now, I get that. that. Yes, that's what it's referencing forward to. But we're not quite there. And he's not saying it's going to happen here in the next few days. He's just saying, look, it's going to happen. So we will see this. It will come to pass. We'll get into more of that later as we keep going. This one is the interesting transition because we have a very specific year, 312 AD, from Smyrna to Pergamos. All right? A very specific thing happens. In 312 AD, Constantine the Great, the emperor of Rome, was carrying on his conquest of the world and he was suffering serious reverses. He was losing in lots of places. And then one day he announced that he had seen in the sky a giant cross and over it were these words. In this sign thou shalt conquer. That's what Constantine is proclaiming to have seen. So what does he do? The pagan king took this to mean that if he would embrace the cross, he would be victorious. So in what probably was an act of desperation, he professed to become a Christian and decreed that the religion of the Roman Empire must henceforth be Christianity. That is a major moment in world history, not just church history, world history. Constantine the Great says this Roman Empire, we're going to be Christians. Okay? Roman Catholic Church comes from this, just so you know. This is where this kind of starts. All goes back. Decreed that the religion of Rome, Roman Empire, must henceforth be Christianity. After his victory, he made the religion of Christianity the state religion, compelled all of his armies to be baptized, and began the era, the era of church history 
which by many historians is hailed as a great blessing, but which in reality became a curse, which you will kind of see that as we keep going. So what happens? The church become a ward of the state and the Roman Empire began to paternalize and subsidize the church and the church and the state become one. I'll get into some other world history and learn a little bit more on that if you want to, but this is where you're going to see Catholicism start rising. Roman Catholic all starts right at this point. It's where all this heads back to. So this is a good thing right here for the church in some sense because the persecution that Smyrna was under with all these Roman emperors going, I'm going to snuff it out. I'm going to push it out. I'm going to kill this thing. One of them rises up and said, no, I'm going to save this thing. I'm going to become one and it's going to be the predominant religion of the world. And it's going to lead us to world victory because under this cross, under this message of Christ, we're going to dominate the world for God. Now you might see why it becomes a curse. Heard of the Crusades? Kind of starts back in this moment. Not the highest point in Christian history. Just putting that out there. Not not the greatest moments. Oh, Pergamum, if I've got this right, let me check my notes here. I had one piece of paper. I knew I can't lose this one piece of paper. And what did I do? I lost that one piece of paper. There it is. Okay. Yep, join the state. Pergamos. The name Pergamos does mean married. This was the married church. What was it married to? Jesus, right? No, it was married to Rome. That was what happened here with this church. It got married to the state. They became one in this, the church and state. That's why over here, you know, we have the separation of church and state in this nation. All kind of comes back to things we've learned in history of why this is a bad idea. Okay, but the church is joined to Rome, not necessarily by the church's decision, but by the Roman decision kind of becomes a good thing for a little while then leads to some other stuff that happened in 312 we assume this time frame lasted about 200 years to around 500 AD we assume that because we're about to get to the church of Thyatira wow this is going really quickly I'm going to try to finish this next one we'll have to call it off Um, around 500 AD we're in the dark ages go look it up go look up your medieval history And just look some stuff up and you'll see this stuff. All of this lines up with events that have happened around the church through church history. And you can line it up on world history books, not just the Bible, not just written by Christian authors. Go look out there and you'll see historians document all of these things. And it lines up and you can take this message and you can lay it over. That's, am I a dispensationalist? Well, maybe you can put that label on me. Yes, I believe in the seven dispensations and I believe in the seven dispensations of the church age. Do you have to do that to be saved? No, but that's my stance on it. I can see how it lines up. It's pretty cool. So I'd want to take some time to get into this before we just jump into chapter four. Let's do one more. And the angel of the church in Thyatira write, the son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet are like burnished bronze. This is that reference back to chapter one. Y'all go back and look at that. I know your deeds and your love and faith and service and perseverance and that your deeds of late are greater than at first, but I have this against you. I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and teaches and leads my bond servants astray so that they commit acts of immorality, eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent and she does not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, I will throw her on the bed of sickness and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds and I will kill her children with pestilence and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds Jezebel y'all remember Jezebel had King Ahab, he had Jezebel, Jezebel led him, 
astray in a bunch of stuff and led a whole bunch of the nation into a lot of bad places while it's filled with the spirit of idolatry. It was all about leading away from Christ. Jezebel was not good for the nation of Israel, and the spirit of Jezebel is not good for the church. This is what's happened in Thyatira. It's about me. It's about I. I'm going to do this my terms, my way. It becomes about fornication and idols. At this point in the church history, in this dark age's time, we see Roman Catholicism really jumping up. This is where we're going to see the Crusades and all that jumping in. We're going to see a lot of things going in bad directions. This lasts from the 500 AD, the Dark Ages, to the 16th century. This is one of the longest church ages. And it's one of the bleakest church ages. It's not, not very well embraced by Jesus. I'll say it that way. The world loved it. The new inventions of discoveries, instead of being used for the good of men, increase destruction, suffering, and sorrow. They are instruments which make it possible. Uh, the recent brutal conflict with its global implications, never has there been more crime, divorce, drunkenness, immorality, atheism, unbelief, and violence than in the so-called enlightened age. Wow. That's horrible. That's also something we're dealing with today. I was a genius, and I didn't underline this one. The word Thyatira means literally a continual sacrifice. It was during the centuries typified by the church of Thyatira that called the Dark Ages that the completeness of the finished work of Christ was denied. And it was added works, ceremonies, rituals, sacrifices. That is why it was mentioned twice in the passage describing this church, which had a religion of works and not grace. And then the Holy Spirit accuses the church of uh, suffering the woman Jezebel to seduce the church. We talked about that. This is... Yeah. It was during these years that the Vandals, the Huns, and the Goths overran Europe and brought them uh, their own idolatrous pagan, pagan worship, the church, in the spirit of compromise, seeking to win them to professing Christianity, adopted part of their pagan idolatry religion of the, this heathen, uh, of these heathen groups, with the result that there emerged from this age in the church was partly Christianity, partly Judaistic, and partly pagan. So this is all coming in. This is a very long period of church history, and it almost reminds me of those 400 years where God goes silent from the Old Testament to the New Testament, and the church just starts, okay, we'll embrace you, we'll embrace you, we'll embrace you, we'll embrace you, kind of like we talked about this morning what Paul was trying to tell him up in uh, Mars Hill, saying, hey, you can't have this and 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 make your plate and call it your Christianity or your belief system and it be Right. But that's what they were doing with Christianity. They we're making all these compromises and bringing things in. Things we may not want to put on this that kind of still falls out today. Look up to why we celebrate Christmas on December 25th. I'm just saying, there's still fallout from this even into today. That comes from a pagan ritual, by the way, of a solstice ceremony. Now, do I treat Christmas like a pagan holiday? No. It's about my Jesus. It's about my Savior. It's about his birth. That's what I'm celebrating. But the date that it's coming to and where it is celebrated, search that back. There's not a biblical reason to celebrate Christmas on December 25th. There's not one word in here that says, hey, if you're going to celebrate his birth, do it on December 25th. That's the best day to do it. But you go back to this time and what's happening, and you'll see it's not necessarily a beautiful moment in church history. But God takes ugly moments and makes beautiful things. We can say that for him. Okay, we're going to close this off right in here. Anything we want to close up with on this one. I want you to go back and look with me real quick. Verse 21. Yes. Um, 
I gave her time to repent, and she does not want to repent of her morality. Behold, I will throw her onto the bed of sickness and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of her deeds. In this moment, he's talking about throwing those who are following of this spirit of Jezebel. They're going to be thrown into the great tribulation. That's why on your timeline, I continued this line all the way over to the rapture because there is going to be the remnant of this false church, this we accept the pagan teachings of church and incorporate it into church. You want evidence of that today? We have churches ordaining homosexuals as ministers of the gospel of Christ in major denominations in this country. That's false church. That's pagan compromise. That's exactly what happened here with Thyatira. That spirit of compromise and spirit of Jezebel has remained as part of the church in different places and will remain until the rapture and the false church will go into tribulation and the true church will be out of here. We'll cover that later as we get there, but that's why that line continues because a lot of that false teaching still remains, still goes on. We do transition to Sardis around the 16th century and we'll pick that up next week because I've hit my time limit. So. What you want to do between now and next week, go ahead and read chapters 2 and 3 at home. There's a lot more stuff in there that we can get into. Something I want you to do, this is kind of homework on it. At some point, I will put the list out in the book of Revelation from chapter 1 all the way to the end. In the book of Revelation, 36 different names for Christ are given. 36 different names for Christ are given through the book of Revelation. Most of them are in chapters 1, 2, and 3. Most of them are right here at the beginning as he's writing to the churches, but there are 36 different names or identifiers to Christ given. There's a little argument on the number. I like 36. I think there are truly 36. We'll put that list out later, but go ahead and start reading and looking up and seeing those and let that encourage you. Seeing who he is, the one who holds the seven churches, the one who or holds the seven stars and walks among the lampstands, the one who's doing that. Let that encourage you. The first, the last, the alpha, the omega, things that we've seen tonight. But there's 36 different names. That's a fun little study. We'll get that list out to you towards the end of the study as we get in. But Father, we thank you for your word. Father, thank you for being with us. Just continue to guide us in this and let us learn from your promise. Let us learn from your truth. Be with us this week in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, have a great week. We'll jump back into this next week. Be blessed.